Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today. Uh, Greg Gun- Gunthorpe with us, owner and operator of Gunthorpe Farms, in, uh, an independent family farm in LaGrange, Indiana, an AGA board member, and a fierce advocate for independent family farmers across our nation. Uh, Greg, I want to give you an opportunity to go ahead and introduce yourself. I know you wear a lot of hats. Um, and Tell us a little bit about you to start off. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Greg Gunthorpe, I'm a family farmer in uh, Northeast Indiana. And we have a um, uh, grass-fed and pastured livestock and poultry operation. Uh, We also have an on-farm USDA inspected uh, slaughter and processing operation. Uh, People ask me what I am. I tell them that I'm an artisan farmer, uh, processor, and a a meat distributor. Uh, We have... um, product uh, in quite a few of the nice restaurants in our region in the Midwest. Uh, We also have product in uh, O'Hare Airport, uh, Wrigley Clubhouse, um, Disney, a few others, just to name a few. But uh, um, Ben uh, grew up on a diversified crop and livestock farm, uh, just uh, right here. Uh, Never really lived anywhere else except for the Um, years that I was in college. And a short version of my story is that come back to farm with the family. And in 1994, uh, the hog market uh, dipped. My dad said that the hog market was over for the independent hog farmer. And I said, I didn't want to quit raising pigs. And my wife and I uh, went off on our own. So it's been an amazing journey. Uh, The hog market crashed and completely obliterated crashed in 98 still said I didn't want to quit raising pigs. And so we built an on-farm processing plant, started marketing primarily to upscale restaurants. Thank you for giving us that, uh, that history, Greg. Um, I was actually, I was really inspired reading your recent testimony at the House Judiciary Subcommittee on the Administrative State Regulatory Reform and Antitrust Hearing. And that was entitled, Where's the Beef? Regulatory Barriers to Entry and Meat Processing. Um, I wanted to dig a little deeper after hearing that testimony. And one of the things that you'd mentioned was the need for reform in areas like subsidies, antitrust enforcement, truth and labeling, and inspection. And I wanted you to provide us with some specific examples of how current regulations are negatively affecting farmers and what changes you would like to see implemented. Sure. Um, Yeah, let me break those um, four areas down really quickly. Um, You know, I... I always uh, mention subsidy reform first. Uh, um, uh, USDA and the federal government uh, um, have a huge influx of uh, funds into um, agriculture, both directly and indirectly uh, with subsidies as well as uh, crop insurance programs. Uh, That puts um, uh, American Grass-Fed Association members, puts independent livestock uh, farmers at a huge disadvantage because we're not a, a... we don't have available those uh, risk management tools in the um, uh, revenue insurance programs. Uh, we don't get subsidies. We don't get price floors. Yet we have to compete on land, uh, rents, and prices uh, in our communities with farmers that do. Uh, you know, we definitely need a level playing field in subsidies. Um, you know, the um, uh, truth and labeling. I'm a huge fan of the, uh, um, the we need um, serious truth in labeling, both in labeling and in advertising. Uh, virtually every single one of the niches that we've created, uh, the large multinational corporations have co-opted them uh, with nothing more than some uh, label changes and some changes in the marketing uh, program. Uh, no meaningful changes for production practices out on the farm. Uh, that puts uh, small niche producers, uh, especially those of us like me that have uh, built uh, niche markets, spent our you know, whole farming career establishing brands and establishing markets, and the big guys can just swoop in and take those with uh, production practices that are significantly uh, cheaper, but imply that they're doing what we're doing. Um, 
you know, in, inspection reform. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the fact that um, uh, I'm, I'm actually, let me reword that. Um, I actually believe that uh, strongly that we need a, a meat and poultry inspection system in the United States. Um, but I also believe that that inspection system is largely geared towards the uh, biggest processors and uh, that doesn't really um, work as well as it could for the smallest processors. And I don't think it's the actual regulations. I think it's more of the process. And I think that that process needs refined because I think the, um, the unintended consequence of regulations and safeguards, which are needed, is that the smallest uh, processors and the smallest producers have the hardest time dealing with those. And uh, while it's improving, uh, USDA has a lot of work yet to do to ensure that the um, smallest processors actually um, can fit into the system and have access to the market. Uh, and then my mind is not functioning really well today because I forget my fourth, uh, um, I say, um, subsidy reform, uh, antitrust enforcement, uh, labeling and inspection. So I guess I've touched on them all. So sorry about that. No, no. And one of the things that you had discussed, and it kind of relates to the, to the different sizes of, of, um, of folks participating in this that you're referring to, and that's redefining the size of establishments. So like, how would that reclassification of small, medium, and large positively impact the, the industry, and in particular, the small and medium-sized folks that we're most worried about lifting up? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the um, I've been throwing that out in discussions for um, actually probably before COVID, but for sure uh, into a lot of discussions uh, since COVID. I think there's an awful lot of confusion uh, even within the industry, uh, for sure within USDA and definitely uh, in Congress on what we're actually talking about when it comes to um, small, uh, very small, uh, mid-scale, medium, uh, large. The, let me just say that the um, Small Business Administration and the USDA currently only have uh, three definitions for uh, meat processors. And that is very small, small, and large. Um, yet we often see in, uh, um, you know, like during the COVID, the stimulus packages, uh, there was legislation that mentioned the word mid-scale. We heard the secretary talking about mid-scale or medium-sized processors all the time. There's no legal definition for those. And I think that we need to define those. Um, and my suggestion for definitions, so let me tell you what the current one is first. The current definition is zero to 10 employees is very small. 11 to 499 employees is small and 501 and larger employees is large. Uh, so I think that, um, uh, you know, the, um, what we end up happening is in a facility that you and I would both say is small that has, say, 15 employees is classified the same as a facility that has 490 employees. And those two are completely different um, in establishments. And we're, we're seeing that impact. And I think the biggest places that you see that impact is on grants. Um, that's one of the places. Uh, you see it on, you know, USDA has uh, funds for uh, to help pay for part of the overtime fees and various size establishments. Um, and I think down the road, um, we'll see the impact if uh, USDA procurement programs actually step up and do what they're talking about in buying and purchasing uh, products from local small uh, regional processors. And uh, because of that, I think that we should actually place the definition. We should move that very small category up from uh, zero to 10. We should move it from zero to 25. Uh, we should go 25 to 150 should be small. We should add a category and that's the mid-scale category. And that mid-scale category should be the 151 to 500. And then large should be 501 and larger. And I think we should add one caveat to that, that if you own more than one facility, you get the cumulative of all your employees across those facilities. So the um, largest operations couldn't just go build a um, one facility that was, you know, 
26 employees, so they had a small facility to funnel product through into a government procurement program. Um, but I think if we did that, I think that uh, we'd have a much more level playing field and we could have an honest discussion when we start talking about, you know, uh, um, how we're going to pass out grants, how we're going to do government procurement, uh, when we're going to implement uh, regulations on various size uh, processing plants. I think it would have a um, huge impact uh, going forward if we would actually all be talking about the um, same size facilities. So you also identified a significant issue with the USDA inspection process. Could you elaborate more on your experiences and why it's crucial to improve this process for small and very small establishments? Sure. Um, you know, I, um, I have a degree in economics from Purdue University that I always tell people that I'm definitely not an economist, but I can remember back to my uh, first econ classes and one of the core tenets of having a fair, competitive, open, and transparent marketplace is that um, uh, there's uh, not um, excessive uh, barriers to entry and exit into a marketplace. And you know, the um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a strong advocate that we need a um, safe and wholesome food supply, and actually uh, firmly believe that there's a place for um, state and uh, federal meat inspection programs. Uh, but I think when uh, those meat inspection programs create erroneous uh, barriers and hurdles that aren't really about food safety, but become about uh, bureaucracy, uh, you know, th those are the issues that I'd like to see. Um, you know, for example, and I, I won't ever mention names, but I end up uh, getting intertwined and interjected into some uh, friends and uh, uh, people that friends of mine uh, say are having troubles with USDA and it, and it always comes down to, uh, what I believe is, uh, you know, the actual process. It's the first amendment rights. It's the people's ability to, um, uh, challenge and criticize an inspector without, uh, um, an expectation of having retaliation. It's the fourth amendment rights of them, uh, you know, taking away their property, taking away their equipment without, uh, you know, proper suspicion or probable cause. And it's the um, 14th Amendment. It's the um, we need due process. And, you know, USDA has things in place where you can have conference calls with policy. Um, you can uh, get the EIAOs, the um, uh, compliance people. They're supposed to spend 25% of their time providing guidance and assistance to small plants. And then there's an appeal process. And all too often, those processes don't work and USDA delays them. And especially they like to delay them uh, for new plants getting started. And, you know, this, this is a really um, high uh, management business. It's, there's a lot of headaches in processing and it's a really low margin business. It's extremely capital management um, intensive. And if USDA holds plants up for months at a time before they can get started, they run out of money. Um, so, you know, that's a real challenge and we need to somehow be able to separate out the um, process challenges from the actual food safety challenges. And the USDA needs some work on that yet, dealing with the um, smallest processors, the um, uh, what I believe are socially disadvantaged um, uh, citizens when they're really small businesses dealing with the um, federal government. So another thing that you, you advocate for has been the expansion of federal state cooperative inspection plans. Could you explain to our listeners what these programs are and why expanding them would benefit the, the smaller members of our industry? Sure. Um, the um, Meat and Poultry Inspection Act um, allows for um, two different programs where state inspected plants can actually um, use a USDA inspected uh, legend. And that is the Talmadge Aikens program. And that program has been around for a long time. Uh, and that is uh, any one of the um, 27 uh, state meat and poultry inspection systems uh, could get authorization where they could just leave their state inspector in that plant 
And then that plant is acts as if it's a um, federal plant and applies federal labels. There's also, a, and I, I believe there's either seven or nine states out of the 27 that operate under that Talma Jenkins uh, program. And then there's a new program that was started in the 2002 Farm Bill. Uh, USDA didn't actually uh, promulgate the um, regulations. It didn't actually start. I think the first plant was 2014, so it took them 12 years to um, get the program actually going. Uh, but now um, state inspection programs can apply to be uh, cooperative inspected uh, state programs. And under that program, um, it's very similar to the Talbot Jenkins program. Uh, the state inspector stays in the plant. So the day-to-day -day dealings for the plant are with the state inspector. And then uh, USDA um, once or twice a year comes out and uh, still inspects the plant. And then they also have oversight over the state inspection program just to make sure that uh, USDA guidelines are being adhered to. Um, largest percentage of the very small plants in this country are, operate either under that Tama Jenkins program or under this cooperative inspection program. And I firmly believe that's because there tends to be less politics and bureaucracy um, in dealing with um, state inspectors and with state governments. And it's much more appropriate and it's a lot more cost effective for taxpayers uh, for these uh, littlest plants. And that's one of the other reasons that I think that we need these uh, definitions changed because we don't need plants up to 499 employees being inspected by state inspection programs. We don't need to put that kind of burden on state programs. Um, but we do need to have where these smallest plants can be inspected locally, dealing with people that are in their community, uh, dealing with programs that have less politics and bureaucracy, but still ensure that they're producing safe and wholesome uh, product. Um, it would just allow there to be more um, small processing uh, and slaughter operations in this country. So what are your thoughts on the USDA's procurement program that's supposed to be prior prioritizing local and regional suppliers? And how could the decision change the game for small and mid-sized producers? Um, you know, the, um, I guess my word I would use is uh, frustrated. Uh, Mike Calicrate and myself has spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, discussing this uh, with the USDA. Uh, um, Andy Green, who's an um, uh, assistant to the secretary, is a concentration specialist, has been very kind to us and keeps putting us in contact with uh, people at the USDA in charge of the procurement program. Uh, we're on the um, second person now because they've uh, changed people. Uh, you know, the secretary, the president, uh, all of the divisions of the USDA um, tell people that they've prioritized uh, local and regional purchasing. Uh, they absolutely have zero programs uh, to buy from uh, small um, processors, small producers in the meat and poultry space. They have no programs for it whatsoever. I believe they have 27 uh, what they consider small businesses that are even authorized to purchase from the um, U or to um, submit solicitation so that the USDA can purchase from them. It's an extremely difficult program uh, to fill out all of the paperwork and to get qualified for. Um, USDA um, and Congress need to put a lot of work into this. Uh, they need to prioritize uh, and earmark a percentage of their purchases that comes from uh, local, regional, and uh, small and very small processors. Um, and it needs to actually be um, harvested in those small and very small uh, plants. It doesn't do any good, uh, you know, in the current program we all know um, allows foreign product um, to come in, be put in a package in the United States, and that's sold as uh, domestic production into the USDA system. That provides no resiliency in our system. Uh, we've all seen what those supply chains uh, can and do happen to them uh, during uh, problems in the economy, um, pandemics, whatever the issue might be. Uh, you know, there, there needs to be a certain portion of our uh, 
USDA procurement that is uh, geared towards resiliency. And in the process, um, it's going to help to create a, um, a price floor. And I don't think that price needs to be something that um, processors and producers uh, make any kind of huge amount of money. Uh, but, you know, as Mike uh, Calicrate always says, uh, you know, just if you could keep our um, freezers empty, and as I always say, if, you know, it uh, uh, provides a safety net if we're going to jump off the cliff to um, build uh, local and regional food, that we know that we have something that'll at least get close to cost of production. Because USDA's procurement programs now uh, are the um, lowest of the lowest of quality. Uh, they're the cheapest products uh, globally. And they do not fit at all for a um, small producer or processor to sell into. Yet their messaging is uh, that they prioritize purchasing uh, local and regional. So they need to do one of two things. Uh, they need to either actually purchase some local and regional, or they need to quit telling the world that they've prioritized uh, local purchasing. And I vote for that they need to actually start um, purchasing some local and regional. And I've been a huge advocate um, that they need to open up their purchasing program uh, to the point that um, groups can submit solicitation. Uh, and I think they need to provide a little bit of funding uh, for the staffing for those groups. And I'm not exactly sure 100% how it would work, uh, but you know, AGA, Animal Welfare Approved, National Farmers Union, you name the cooperative or group or whatever, um, could submit solicitations at pricing on behalf of their members. And then any of the members um, could fill those rather than each individual member having to go through that process that takes months, if not years, to get qualified to be able to sell to the USDA. It would make it so that the program could actually work and it would make it so that, um, uh, you know, groups could uh, um, provide a much greater mem uh, benefit to their members uh, because, you know, and then the groups could actually certify that those members met the requirements. I think it would make it a lot simpler. So you also highlighted the importance of addressing ethics issues and the revolving door within the USDI. Well, what potential impact could those changes have on the future of truly sustainable farming? Uh, you know, it, it would have a huge, huge impact if we would actually enforce the ethics rules in the United States, the two-year, the four-year, the lifetime uh, bans on, uh, you know, that revolving door of, uh, are they a member of the, are they a big shot in the um, trade associations? Are they a um, vice president or CEO of a, um, one of the big pharmaceuticals or ag companies, or are they working at one of the government agencies, you know, you uh, draw those Venn diagrams and a large percentage of them are in all three and you don't know which one they're in at the time. Uh, you know, the most glaring uh, obvious example in the meat and poultry industry was the last administrator of the um, meat and poultry inspection system uh, three days after he retired, uh, took a job uh, with a $5 million sign-on bonus uh, with JBS. Um, and we were the only developed country in the world uh, that didn't shut down imports after that huge uh, um, scandal in Brazil over uh, bribing politicians and inspectors. You know, and the, those kind of revolving door issues happen way too often. And, you know, once, once you become involved in advocacy work and politics, you start to realize that, yes, the um, people that we elect can have a huge, huge impact on policy, but you also realize that there's that fourth level of government. It's the people in these agencies, it's these career um, bureaucrats. They have a huge impact on the policy. And some of them have no problem whatsoever waiting out the um, two or four years or eight years for whatever the um, Congress or the White House is in for. And they just continue to, um, you know, become entrenched and do the same thing that they've done. So it makes it really, really difficult um, for the um, little guys and the people that want actual um, transformational progressive change in rural America to get that when uh, big ag, 
um, has a large portion of the um, USDA that they really own. As an independent farmer, I've experienced the negative effects of the big food cartels firsthand. Could you provide some insight onto how the enforcement of, the, of strict antitrust regulations could change the agricultural landscape for everyone? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, the, um, we have oligopolies or monopolies um, that control the uh, meat and poultry sector right now. And I, um, I think uh, that um, our country was wise enough uh, 100 or so years ago uh, to put some laws in place, the um, Clayton Act, the Sherman Act, the um, uh, Packer and Stockyards Act. They realized that um, concentrated power um, took away opportunities for producers and it takes away choices um, for consumers. And as a producer, um, you know, to my fellow producers, I don't think I have to tell anyone uh, that the um, market is extremely dysfunctional, uh, but it's just as dysfunctional if you want to be involved in the um, wholesale side on the um, meat and poultry sector. Um, it is extremely difficult to get market access. Um, you know, the um, big guys uh, control the market. Uh, it's um, difficult. And there, we have a lot of uh, AGA members that are um, small businesses and they're scrappy entrepreneurs and scrappy entrepreneurs. Um, you know, that's part of the American dream. We ought to be able to fit into the marketplace. Um, but the marketplace at every single corner you turn, uh, it's the table is tilted towards the big guy. And if we're going to tilt the table at all in the United States, we ought to tilt the table towards the little guy. And it's, you know, the pendulum has went far enough the other way. Um, you know, we're, um, we have a uh, grass fed sheep uh, enterprise on the farm. And uh, right now the um, sheep market is extremely depressed. And I question, I've questioned lots of people. If the Rosen plant out in Colorado uh, didn't get sold, and JBS didn't buy it, didn't turn it into a, a beef uh, processing only facility rather than having the capabilities of 20% uh, of the lamb harvest in the United States, would we not have been able to um, you know, keep the um, lamb market and the cattle market for US producers better in this country? That was a textbook uh, antitrust issue. You shouldn't be able to take the largest importer of uh, lambs in the United States should not be able to buy a lamb slaughter plant, close it for lamb slaughter, and turn it into a beef import processing plant. Um, you know, when, when we already have oligopolies and monopolies, they need to start enforcing some of the rules. Um, in the pig industry, the pig industry is over for the um, independent um, hog guy, has been since 1998. Um, you know, and the, lots of people will tell you, and, uh, you know, I'd say the same thing, uh, you know, many buyers and many sellers uh, fix markets a lot more than government intervention. Uh, but when you've got, uh, you know, sectors of this market that have 85% of it is controlled by four players and they're quickly becoming uh, that level of concentration globally, uh, you have to have a government that ensures a level playing field because um, we don't have a level playing field now. How have you seen misleading labels like grass fed, organic, natural, um, even um, hopefully we get a good decision on this, but even previously product of USA um, impact the consumer's perception? of what they're buying in the store, of what's local, of what's sustainable, of what's from this country. Uh, what changes in labeling policies do you feel would provide more transparency? Um, truth and labeling is really, really important. Uh, truth and labeling and the lack of truth and labeling in the United States fits back into that whole antitrust issue. Um, you know, I think ethics and truth and labeling are required. Um, for there to be a countervailing um, force in the marketplace. And uh, 
um, smaller um, wholesale producers. So those trying to sell in uh, through distributors to the restaurant trade, um, those trying to sell to um, retailers. Uh, it's virtually impossible to get shelf space and it's virtually impossible to get shelf space because uh, labels are allowed to be misleading in this country. And if you go up to um, uh, a retailer and you've got a branded uh, grass fed um, that's actually, um, you know, how, whatever you want your term wants to be, um, holistic uh, management, adaptive multi paddock, uh, rotational grazing, true actual animals out on grass, harvesting grass. Um, you have that product, it's domestic. Um, you can get no shelf space at all because you're competing with the um, uh, big fours uh, feedlot brands uh, that are just feeding or claim they're just feeding forage in a feedlot. Um, and you're also competing with the um, foreign imports. So if you put product of USA grass fed, about 5% of the product in the United States in the marketplace, by my estimations, is actual rotationally grazed um, independent family farms processed in the United States. About 10% of the um, product in the marketplace is um, fed in a feedlot, fed forages, um, and put grass fed on the label. Um, the other 85% with product of USA on the label is foreign product put in a package here. I don't know whether it's grass fed. Maybe it is. Um, there's, you know, we're one of the few countries in the world that has a largely um, grain fed uh, cattle supply. But you know, the marketplace, the big four can then turn around and take what is a premium product in the rest of the world, the grain fed beef, buy it for uh, you know, subpar commodity prices here, turn around, buy grass fed beef in the rest of the world at commodity prices, sell it for a premium product here. It's quite a racket. And uh, the USDA knows it's a racket. It's a violation of every one of those acts I mentioned before. Um, you know, the uh, Meat and Poultry Act, if you read the thing, the first paragraph says that uh, USDA is charged with ensuring that uh, labels aren't misleading and they're not misrepresented. Um, they don't get around to fulfilling those duties. And it's not just grass fed, it's not just product of USA. You know, the, my county has about 150 dairies left because uh, we're um, still, you know, there's a lot of Amish in our county. We're the third largest Amish community in the country. And uh, they have some produce organic milk. They're getting destroyed. If any of them have to buy feed, uh, they close up because, you know, you go out west uh, where there's not um, grass because of the rainfall, um, yet they have uh, organic dairies. The regulations for organic requires that 30% of the dry matter for those cows come from the actual cow grazing, harvesting grass. Um, there's large organic dairies in parts of this country that it's not even feasible for there to be enough grass to get 30% of the dry matter on those, you know, um, organic, organic. Uh, hens the same way. Uh, you go about 100 miles north of me here, 10% um, of the organic eggs in the country come from one farm that has over a million hens. Uh, they're supposed to have outside access. Um, you know, you can look it up online uh, with drone and satellite footage. Uh, those chickens are never outside. Um, and people would not expect when they're buying organic eggs that they're getting them from a chicken farm with a, a million hens any more than they'd expect when they're buying organic milk that they're getting it from a farm that has 20,000 cows, nor would they expect that if they're buying grass-fed beef that says product of USA, that it's coming from Brazil or Australia. You know, the um, uh, it's a small percentage, I'd guess maybe 10 or 15% of the consumers uh, that will buy um, products for a premium in the marketplace, yet that premium is all going to the um, big guys and we're denied market access. And uh, that creates a loss of opportunities for farmers and a loss of choice uh, for consumers. And it's a complete violation of every single concept that everybody says that they believe in capitalism and they believe in a free market because we should actually be able to compete in a marketplace uh, that works for us. And so I, I think when you get all said and done, 
both sides of the aisle should be extremely, um, you know, ecstatic about wanting truth and labeling and wanting true competition in the marketplace. So your journey from, from the commodity pig market, right, to the niche market of dress pigs to the top rated restaurants is really inspiring. So how has that experience shaped your views on the necessary policy reforms in the ag sector? Oh man, that's, that's a really deep question. We could go on for um, hours about that, but you know, the, um, I think um, uh, in general, um, consumers and even farmers uh, don't have a um, broad enough understanding of how their food's raised, how it's processed, how it gets to them. And I think it's exciting to see that there are uh, um, more that do. Um, but I think my um, trip up to the Judiciary Committee um, showed me uh, that I think even uh, Congress and our um, politicians, and I think even the um, bureaucrats all the way to the top end of the inspection system, uh, we, have, we have quite a few people that don't understand how the system works and uh, don't understand uh, either choose to not understand or don't understand how the system is actually tilted uh, towards um, big ag. Um, and you know, the, we need to ensure, as I said before, if we're gonna tilt the table at all, the table should be tilted towards um, small producers, the independent family farms, the independent processors. And uh, my view has been uh, changed drastically because uh, you know, I, I would have told you I would have been the same as a lot of the other people that, you know, you just build a processing plant, um, get a product so that you can take it to market. And I would have never dreamed that um, market access, competition, uh, risk um, factors, that all of those things that the federal government has programs, policy in place to ensure that the big guys um, get those things taken care of and that the little guys don't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, you know, uh, we built a processing plant. I was as naive as lots of people that are building them now that you just build it, you get your product and you'll have market access. And it's like a good friend of mine, Will Harris says, uh, you know, it's a huge hill to get up uh, to get USDA inspection, but it's only when you get to the top of that hill that you realize that it's the mountain on the other side that's a real challenge. And that's uh, figuring out um, market access and how to fit in this concentrated and consolidated marketplace. So, and that, I think that really leads me to my next question, which is we've talked about a lot of issues. There's a lot of barriers in the way of folks that are small that want to be successful the way you have been successful over the years. What advice do you give folks that are, that are smaller, that are just trying to get started off in trying to navigate all of these different barriers that are in front of them? What, what is the best way forward? Um, I think my, my first initial advice would be, um, I think that you have to um, uh, think globally, um, but act locally. I, I challenge everyone to be involved in uh, policy. I think that the more voices that we could put in and interject into this, uh, the more opportunities that we have uh, to move the needle on policy to where it'll affect us. But I think that um, regardless of whether policy changes or not, because it can be extremely frustrated, frustrating. You know, I, I started working on policy when uh, Clinton was president and Glickman was secretary of ag. I served on the USDA Small Farm Commission back then. And I, there's lots of days I don't feel like we've moved the needle hardly at all. In some ways we have, but uh, some ways we haven't. But I think regardless, I think you have a responsibility to yourself and to your family and to your community um, to build a business uh, that can thrive. And I think uh, regardless of how difficult that they make this, I think that there's still opportunities um, to um, create businesses uh, that um, thrive uh, throughout these um, challenges. You know, um, I don't think that building a processing plant and uh, going after a wholesale market right now is a wise thing to do at all. I actually uh, think that the wholesale market for the smallest players is over. Um, I think that USDA could make some policy changes to point maybe that could come back. Uh, that's uh, 
debatable. Um, I think that there's plenty of opportunities to build a um, direct to consumer model. Um, I think I think there's lots of opportunities there to build a brand and to actually connect with consumers. I, I think that's where if I was doing something, I think that's where I would um, focus. And then I I still think that there's uh, big opportunities in the um, ruminant livestock space um, at scale um, to actually uh, do regenerative agriculture. You know, adaptive multi-paddock uh, grazing or holistic uh, grazing, whatever you want to call it, um, works. It's a um, great way um, to lower cost of production. Um, every single, uh, you know, forage that you can grow, uh, that you can get into a room and an animal, um, you know, and it has bunches of other uh, benefits, sequester carbon, uh, lower runoff, uh, you know, higher health for animals, you name it. Uh, but at scale, and it's, uh, you know, it's appropriate at scale because it works. Um, you know, it's as easy to shift, uh, you know, thousands of animals as it is to shift a few. So, uh, you know, I, I think there's, there's, like I said, there's still some big opportunities. Uh, you know, we're going to combine that with um, uh, solar grazing. I think that's a huge opportunity for us. Uh, we're partnering with uh, British Petroleum to control vegetation on one of their solar sites. Um, starting next spring uh, with sheep. Uh, you know, if you can combine low cost um, sheep production uh, with providing a service uh, to control vegetation, and then if we were smart enough, which we won't be because we don't have the time or the resources, but if we could uh, then process those and sell those direct to individuals, uh, you know, that would be the ultimate. But um, so, I, and I, I think there's I think that's the biggest thing that um, sustainable agriculture, that direct marketing, that uh, grass-fed production provides. It'll never be easy, but it provides an awful lot more opportunities to bring the next generation into agriculture for something that they actually want to do. Thank you, Greg. That's an excellent answer. Um, you know, as one of our board members, you you work with us in the policy space on a lot of different initiatives. And uh, recently, I think we've seen some of the things that we've all dedicated so much of our time to start to come to fruition. And I just wanted to ask you what what are some of the initiatives that you've seen have come to fruition that you really have appreciated, and what have been some of your favorite recent wins that you've seen on the on the policy front in terms of things AGA has been involved in. Sure, that, that's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, lots of people don't get to see behind the curtain to know what some of their organizations um, actually do. But it, the American Grass Fed Association has been a huge advocate for uh, independent family farms, for pasture, uh, livestock and poultry producers, um, and for the independent processor. And I think one of our uh, biggest wins, and I cross my fingers that it's the biggest win because uh, we're in the rulemaking process and I'm sure that I've watched this long enough, the federal government can still come up with uh, a way to partner with big ag to change it. But I think our biggest win for sure, and uh, we were extremely influential, uh, you know, we got to for sure give credit to Joe Maxwell and Angela Farm Action because they were just as instrumental. But it's that country of origin labeling. It's in rulemaking process right now uh, that animals uh, have to be uh, born, uh, slaughtered, and are born, raised, and harvested in the United States in order to bear that country of origin labeling. And I'm a firm believer that that's a place we start on these egregious labeling because it's forced USDA to put systems in place to actually survey consumers, know what the expectations of consumers are, and then put the rules in place. And they just announced that they're starting to do the surveys for um, antibiotics and animal claims. Uh, so I think what I was hoping for is actually starting. So, you know, I think that my grandkids might have an agriculture where they can actually get market access based on what uh, things say on labels and is truthful. Um, the American Grass Fed Association has been extremely instrumental in uh, getting these uh, very small plant stakeholder meetings around the country. You know, the, um, we have some members that are processors. We also have all of our members that um, uh, face challenges in uh, finding access to um, good quality processing. And, you know, so the, like I said, we're not talking about uh, 
weakening food safety rules or anything like that, but making it so that the littlest processors um, can deal with uh, USDA in a manner that's the same or at least equal to what the big guys can. And I think our biggest win in that space uh, was the uh, USDA used to hold the um, uh, little plants, especially the um, uh, little um, red meat plants. They used to hold them to a different standard on stunning than what they did the big plants. And, uh, you know, they, they won't acknowledge that they changed it, but I could show you all the paperwork. They changed it. Uh, um, little plants now get the same uh, benefit of a second immediate stun uh, where the big plants, uh, you know, you could, Temple Grandin talks about this at times, uh, you know, the big plants will have a second stun on uh, one to 4% of the animals going through there. Little plants ever did that, they got closed down. Uh, they had enforcement action and uh, about two thirds of the enforcement action uh, miraculously there's about 90 every single quarter. It's almost like they have a quota, but I'm not saying they have a quota. Um, but about uh, two thirds of those um, were second stuns in little plants. And literally their policy said that that wasn't an issue in large plants and it was in little plants. And uh, it took several years for we got that changed. I think that's one of our um, bigger um, wins that people won't ever notice that we got. I think one of our um, uh, biggest wins here uh, is starting to happen. Um, and, you know, I'm sure most people are aware Proposition 12 in California is going to require that um, uh, gestation crates not be used for um, breeding sows. And uh, in this interim time, you can self-certify up to, I think it's till January 1. Don't quote me on any uh, dates or anything like that. But until January 1 of 2024, I think you can self-certify to send pork into California. After that, uh, you're going to have to have a um, third party um, certification. And most of the third party certifications are going to be at a cost level uh, that small producers wouldn't be able to afford to get certified to um, ship into California. Um, American Grass Fed Association is really, really close and will get um, the ability to be one of the um, certifiers that can uh, have Prop 12 compliant pork. That will be huge for the um, small pasture pig producers of the United States, uh, you know, because uh, the small pasture pig producers of the United States can afford American Grass Fed Association certification where they couldn't afford a um, global animal partnership uh, $15,000 audit, you know. So, um, so the, those kind of things are the, um, you know, the, big policy wins that I see. We we have some uh, little policy wins. Uh, Carrie is really good about uh, if uh, small processors or small producers have troubles uh, getting uh, labeling uh, through approvals through USDA. Uh, American Grass Fed Association works with um, producers and processors on that. Um, some of the other um, regulatory challenges, American Grass Fed Association is really good at. Uh, so, you know, the, the like I said before, it, it can be uh, frustrating because sometimes you feel like you're just kicking a can down the road and you'd actually like to kick a can through a goal. And it takes a long time, but, you know, uh, we keep kicking the can down the road and we have some wins every once in a while. So um, and uh, appreciate everybody's support and appreciate everybody um, interjecting their voice into these conversations because uh, the more people that we can get involved, uh, the easier it is to um, kick the can down the roads. That's absolutely right. So last of all, Greg, I just want to ask you probably the most important question of all day. If anyone wants to learn more about Gunthorpe Farms, where can they go? Um, you know, if you, uh, I su I'd have several suggestions. Uh, um, please follow my um, politics on the pastures. I've uh, been too busy to put much up on there, but I got some people that um, post some stuff up there. We like to get discuss uh, political issues there. Uh, follow me on Facebook. Um, uh, I um, uh, like to um, have some conversations there. Um, follow my son on Instagram if you want to see what's actually going on on the farm. Uh, my son is just amazing on his organizational and management skills and his uh, pursuit of uh, regenerative and sustainable agriculture and the stuff that he puts on Instagram that he's worth a follow there. Um, and if you want to see something that's uh, a little more 
interesting and a little more on the controversial and kind of a little bit more edgy, um, follow me on Twitter and uh, try to get me wound up. Not that it takes too much, but I like to um, agitate, and, uh, call a few people out on Twitter. So that's always fun too. So, um, and uh, you know, we have a website. I don't know that we do a lot with it, but uh, gunthorpefarms.com. Uh, so. Right. Excellent. Excellent. And Greg, any last words before we let you go here? Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate that. I just want to know if you have any last thoughts for everyone. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me today. Um, uh, the only thing that I probably didn't mention that I think I should have was that, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I've been involved in policy for uh, 20 plus years. Um, I think it was actually the um, opportunity of a lifetime uh, to go up and uh, testify at the House Judiciary Committee. It was kind of a little bit um, uh, surreal in a way, but um, uh, I think that uh, long term, uh, you know, the whole thing is about uh, building networks. And I've been just shocked and amazed at the amount of people that have reached out um, since uh, testifying at the House Judiciary Committee. And I feel like, you know, uh, um, that changing the federal government, first you have to convince them that there's actually a problem. Uh, you have to convince them that you have a solution. And then, you know, it's like turning a um, freighter, uh, freight liner around out in the ocean. You know, you, you turn the udder, but, uh, rudder, but it doesn't move very quick. But once it finally does, it goes in another direction. You know, we've been working on these uh, local foods, uh, small farm, regenerative ag, issues for decades um, and I, I feel like that it's no longer and I think COVID helped us with that regards I feel like it's no longer that we have to um, convince them that these are issues uh, that are worth um, fighting for and I, I think one of the biggest ways you can prove that is that um, we have supporters all across the spectrum and we have people that come to this all across the spectrum from the um, far left to the far right are huge fans of uh, local food and regenerative ag. And I think that um, they are listening now. Uh, so now's our time uh, to actually get the um, progressive transformational changes that we want for rural America to create opportunities for everyone and to create choices, real choices for consumers. Let's turn the freight liner around. Yeah.